Morning. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the uh, second in our series on, of science, policy, and law, 10 years after 9-11. I'd like to welcome, uh, welcome you all here and invite our Chancellor, Michael Drake, up to the stage to say a few introductory remarks. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Richard. I appreciate it. Nice to have everyone here this afternoon. We were, um, this last summer, doing a, in, in some of the data that we were gathering, we were gathering data on our impact on the community. And we have an impression of what we do or an impression of what we should do. And we thought that maybe once in a while we should ask people what we actually do, what, what those people who we do things to and for think. So we have surveys that we give to our students every couple of years. And they fill out an elaborate array of things that talk about what uh, what their experience has been like, and we try to read that and and to respond appropriately. It, this was a, a nice uh, survey we did of people in Orange County to find out what the university meant to them. And uh, I'm going to digress for a moment and and um, contextualize this. My prior uh, life was that uh, of an ophthalmologist, so I spent a lot of time being an eye doctor, and I was working. Uh, with a group called the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and we we had our uh, our, our natural and like a cobra mongoose, sort of our natural um, competitor for a certain space, which was the optometrists of the world. And so we we don't think they're bad people necessarily. And if any of you are <laughs> an optometrist, I don't think that you're a bad person necessarily. Uh, uh, but but we you know we were. Um, there are political issues that happen and, and uh, laws and scope of practice and things. And so the academy was working on behalf of itself to try to make sure to differentiate itself. And what we did, we, were, we sat around, um, and the we was mostly them. I mean, I was a smallish uh, person <laughs> with this group of, of, of elders. But we kind of thought, gosh, what things differentiate us from optometrists? We feel different. And for those who know, there's a, the difference, the main difference is that ophthalmologists go to medical school first and our surgeons. And, uh, and so we said, well, we go to medical school and then we're surgeons. We, we, we spend lots of time in the operating room. And so we thought, well, eye surgery, that's, you know, the real differentiating point. And, and then they did a test audience and they found that uh, in listing differentiating points that when you mentioned eye surgery to people, they were repulsed. Uh, that, that, that they thought it was, they somehow thought this was icky and um, undesirable. And so we realized that wasn't a good differential point. And so the thing that we had sort of arrived at through great um, thought and care was actually a turnoff to the uh, population. So what actually we used for the, the, the little moniker, this would have been in late 1980s probably was IMD to uh, focus with the medical training part, but keep away from the knives and sutures. So the university then in doing this kind of a, a survey, I'm fast forwarding to now, we're interested in what kind of things we do that impact people. And uh, there were several things that we do that were impactful, others that we thought were impactful that weren't so impactful. So our healthcare programs are very impactful. We appreciate that. We, another thing that was found to be impactful and that we appreciate is training, uh, educating uh, the young people to be leaders in the next generation, to be the employees and business owners and community leaders of the next generation. That was an in, impactful thing. A third thing that we did that was impactful is um, uh, provide employment and economic stimulus for the region. That was seen as being a, a valuable contribution uh, of the university. And then the fourth was that we brought uh, intellectual uh, variety and diversity and thought uh, to the community. So we um, have a variety of things that we do. Uh, uh, we dedicated the Robert Cohen Theater last Friday. We had our medal awards with the entertainment from the School of the Arts on Saturday. But we also do things like what we're doing today, which is that we are able to uh, bring luminous people from a variety of walks of life together to be able to share their experiences and perspectives with you on those things that are really the burning issues of our time. So we're having a, a series. This is, as uh, uh, Richard said, this is the second in a series of three 
presentations uh, 10 years after 9-11. Any of you who are, filling, who are signing things today are filling out things, notice that today is one of those extra cool days. It's 11-1-11, so it's just a whole series of straight lines, um, <laughs> yeah, which I really I got a kick out of that. And I, I was telling my secretary that I remember 6-6-66, and she was aghast that <laughs> I was cognizant and aware at the time. Uh, uh, thinking of 9-11, though, and those things that happened then, and, and the way the country has uh, responded uh, to 9-11, the way that that uh, it has changed our world. And there are things that UC Irvine has been doing since then and we were doing before. We have uh, several uh, entities on campus that are very important. The Center for Unsecure Unconventional Security looks um, uh, very uh, in, in great depth at uh, how we protect ourselves and what it means to do that. And we have a Center for Disaster Medicine that studies various challenges to maintaining, maintaining the uh, art of emergency medicine and responders. As you might have seen, the president just yesterday was looking at uh, the drug stores and how we make sure that we have adequate uh, pharmaceutical stores. We have a program on interactive and collaborative technologies that explores how information technologies, information technology can be used to improve our ability to respond and to recover. And all of these things are active programs that we have on campus. But for real participation, we'd like to bring people who are really experts in the variety of the measures that we do for security and, and, and give them a chance to work with uh, you and to talk with you and to share their experience. So we're really pleased to be able to draw people together and, and to have this dialogue. So I, um, as I mentioned, learned uh, that it's not always the surgery that's the important part, but um, the training that goes into it. I appreciate the fact that you're all here today participating in this discussion, and I look forward to hearing what our panelists have to say. Thank you all for being here. Well, thank you, Chancellor Drake. And, uh, you know, since 9-11, since um, security affairs in, in this country and around the world have been dominated by a set of challenges that I think we can say share three sorts of characteristics. Many of these challenges are very complex. They're, they're complex things. They're highly interactive. So what happens in one domain affects many other domains. And in many ways, they're unprecedented. They're either entirely new, like cybercrime, or they're new in terms of the speed and scale on which they operate. So we have a, we have a, we have a, a very complex security situation that we are facing today. And alongside these threats are a host of other significant challenges that are not always classified as security threats, but share the characteristics of complexity and interconnectedness and being in some way, significant way, unprecedented. The, 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 the prospect of health care co costs rising to over $13,000 per capita in this country puts us in a domain that is unprecedented for us and for, for anyone else on the planet. The enormous burden that we now see our students bearing in terms of debt when they graduate puts them in a different position than earlier generations and than their peers in other countries around the world. Student loan, student debt now exceeds credit card debt in this country. The, a Congress that seems to be gridlocked by partisan politics and unable to tackle many of these changes, that's an America that, that's unfamiliar to many, many people, and so on and so on. In this type of context, it's very easy to get frustrated. It's very easy to believe that things can only get worse. That if you're 20 years old today, what you have to look forward to is a deteriorating economy that is going to be eclipsed by the emerging markets in Asia, a massive health care burden, a social security system that is dysfunctional, and a capital that isn't able to solve these sorts of problems. And a lot of people are feeling overwhelmed, and this sense of being overwhelmed is being reinforced in multiple ways by our press, for example, who continually tells us that the magnitude of our problems, our challenges, is certainly likely to overwhelm us and may well lead to catastrophe. In fact, there's a large group of people who think that catastrophe is virtually inevitable and maybe the only thing that, shape, that, that allows us to reform the institutions that we have in ways that will bring them into alignment with the needs of our century. Now, 
bombarding our youth with this rhetoric of despair, with this constant, constant reinforcement of the idea that things have spiraled out of control and can no longer be managed effectively, comes with a serious downside. And it's not at all like what we're hearing people tell youth in other countries, where they are telling their young people, this is your century, you own it, you're going to solve the problems. The century, the next few years are going to be great for you. So we'll, we're telling our young people, wow. Other countries are telling their young people, go out and get things. There's a lot of opportunity out there. Now, I don't want to suggest that the problems that we face are not significant. And, there is, and it is important to ask the question, can we handle the security challenges and the, and the other challenges of the 21st century? I certainly believe we can, um, but I think that there are areas in which we have been unduly complacent, and there are areas in which we have lost ground and continue to lose ground. So there are critical steps that we need to take in terms of things like preparedness if we're going to meet the challenges uh, that are going to define the next decade, the next two decades, the next three decades here and abroad. And if we take these steps, then I think we will do a significant amount to bolster the confidence of the next generation. And that, will, that has the potential to confer multiple benefits on our society. A confident next generation, a confident next generation will be a generation that has hope, and hope drives progress. And if we take that confidence away from them, we are already disarming them in the face of unique and unprecedented challenges. So this panel today, and it's a delight to have so many of these, uh, so many distinguished people stand, uh, sitting beside me here. I was going to ask the question, what have we learned? What have we learned in the decades since 9-11, since the attacks of 9-11, about the challenges we face in the 21st century? What have we done in the past decade to ensure that we're better prepared? And what have we failed to do? What needs to be done? We have a distinguished panel of speakers representing an array of expertise. And I want to say just a couple of words about each one of them before they take the stage. Donna Barbish, retired Major General, who really stepped into new terrain by, by enlisting uh, during the Vietnam War and moving quickly up the ranks, commanding a MASH hospital, attending the US Army War College is today the president of Global Deterrence Alternatives and a world expert on preparedness and the challenges that we face. Christy Koenig, who has had a very distinguished career that includes a five-year stint, stint with the Department of Veteran Affairs, is a professor here at UCI of Emergency Medicine and also the founding director of the Center for Disaster Medical Sciences, a unique entity and something that, that UCI has, that Orange County has, that distinguishes it from the rest of the country and the rest of the world. A truly unique and important type of research and education facility. Gloria Mark, a professor in the Department of Informatics here at UCI, who is doing incredibly interesting work on how information technologies and other technologies are being used during disasters, how they can be used to improve situa situational awareness and communication and response. Dr. Carl Schultz, who, by the way, with Christie, is the, uh, the co-editor of what is the, really the, the, the world's textbook on disaster medicine. Um, he, too, is a professor of emergency medicine here at UCI and director of research at the new Center for Disaster Medical Science. We have to Gloria's left, Alain Stevie, who comes, to, who comes here via France and Israel, a former Israeli special forces, um, and also a world martial arts champion, who is uh, now the founder and president of Direct Measures International and Outcome Logic, two Orange County companies focused on uh, meeting the security challenges of the 21st century. And finally, at the end of the panel, Bert Tussing, Professor Bert Tussing, graduate of the Citadel, 24 years in the Marine Corps, uh, including, uh, I think, an interesting, an interesting point. He was, he was uh, one of George, the first George Bush's uh, pilot, private pilots. And so got to see, uh, uh, got to see a, a view of the world that very few people have access to. 
what the president is like when he's relaxed and sitting at Camp David, and so on. He has now, for the tw past 12 years, been a professor at the Army War College in Carlisle Barracks. Um, and his continuing service to this country has now focused in the area of homeland security. So please join me in, in, in welcoming this distinguished panel and uh, to hear the UCI. <laughs> We're going to be filming this entire session since film and, and is, is largely how we how we take these ideas and and, and bring them to a broader audience. Um, each person will speak for about ten or twelve minutes, and we'll have ample time afterwards for questions and so on. So maybe I could begin by inviting. I don't, I don't believe there was an order established here, was there? In the uh, in the film thing, but I would like to I would like to start off by inviting Donna Barbershop. <coughs> <laughs> to, so we we can begin at the at at at, at the level of, of sort of national security and homeland security, and work our way down to Orange County. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Well, good afternoon. So nice to be here today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how we deter threats and then tell you what that means. But first, let's talk about what's in the news today? What's happening? And how do you feel about that based on what it was like on September 11th? In Australia, we've had a lot of um, challenges with those folks moving from one country to another illegally. So that today we passed an anti-smuggling um, bill. We have nuclear powers supposedly out of control. Iran's navy is threatening the security in the Gulf. And Libyan authorities looking at how do we control weapons. Today's news, ladies and gentlemen. Are we safer today than we were in 2000? I'd like to talk a little bit about that, if I can get this to work. NBC News, NBC meaning nuclear, biological, and chemical. This is what news I got a couple days ago on some of the activities out there. We don't need to go through them, just realize that today we are in a dangerous world. Some comments that, that were identified as we were being addressed. So how are we different and what are we doing differently today than we were several years ago? Security and natural disaster. Does it fit? Weapons of mass destruction versus disasters. Hurricanes, tsunamis, I was just in Taiwan with uh, my colleague over here talking about how things have changed since the tsunami that devastated so much of that area. Natural disasters provide opportunities for terrorists. If you have a death rate of 25,000, that's a pretty significant death rate. If you take a look at the death rate from pandemic flu, 44 million people worldwide in 1918. Thinking about 25,000, maybe that is some number that we need to pay attention to. But 33% increase in deaths from terrorism a year after a disaster that causes in the area of 25,000 deaths. Pretty significant numbers. How does that happen and why does that set up an area where terrorists might take advantage of our environment? If we look at the social unrest across the nation, or across the world, excuse me, and look at the uh, changes that we have due to this financial crisis that's going on, I'm visually challenged here with my equipment, but you can see the, the areas of the world that are a little more challenging than some of those other areas. Very high in the dark red area, moderately high, and then of course here we are 
a little safer. But what's happening out there that's causing something like the financial crisis to create a problem with global unrest? When we look at the British riots, we see that those rioters came from 44 different countries. 44 different countries. And that one third of the youth, this is the age 11 to 16, one third of them had been expelled from school. So when we start to look at some of these issues and we dissect the issues, we find out that there's a little more depth and understanding necessary to be able to identify what can we do about these challenges. If one third of the people, of the young folks that were involved in some of this unrest were actually expelled from school, what does that tell us about our education system and what can we do to motivate people to stay in school and to be less part of the problem and more part of the solution? As we look at this, I wanted to frame our discussion today with what we're doing here, science, policy, and the law. Science, evidence-based, something we can measure, something we've studied, and has knowledge and rationality. Policy, we have a process designed to improve decision-making and again, achieve rational outcomes. The law, rules and guidelines that are enforceable, well maybe, or enforced, well maybe. How many of you speed on the highway? Sometimes we have things enforced and some things we are not enforced. So what's really missing here is this human factor. We have to design programs for what people do as some of my colleagues might mention later, for what they do, not for what we want them to do. And we have to discuss how are we going to do that. We cannot establish a policy that says, says something to the effect that everyone in this room will not have anything to eat until tomorrow. Because we know that you'll probably eat something before tomorrow. So we have to have human-based expectations, reality-based expectations, if we're going to move a process forward. So the process that I've been working on for the last 10 or 15 years is deterrence through what's called resilience. Deterrence to discourage, discourage someone or somebody from doing something and to prevent the outcome to occur. So if on 9-11 we were effective at deterrence, we wouldn't have had the events of 9-11. The military has a process of mutually assured destruction. That was our Cold War deterrence theory. If you hit me, I'll hit you back. It doesn't work when we're in this ambiguous environment. What does work is a resilience process. Having the ability to adapt, to withstand the impact, and then to recover from the disruption. So that if on 9-11, as you saw, we had a number of casualties and a significant impact to our country, if we had been more resilient, we would have returned to normal more quickly than we have. But I would suggest to you, we still are not back to what we would call normal. Homeland Security resilience is something that we've been working on for some time. Uh, lots of documentation out there. But what our objective is to mitigate hazards, enhance preparedness. Oftentimes, we then come back and say, prepared for what? Significant questions that we have to address. Ensure effective emergency response. Well, define effective and then to rapidly recover. But resilience is designed to have us all return to normal as quickly as possible. If we look at way, the way we were and the way we started to evolve and the, uh, the path we're on today, these were the traditional responsibilities of 
our homeland security. Then the new and evolving threats of weapons of mass destruction, I would offer that it wasn't really new, but maybe only newly paid attention to. And then the core competencies today that we're looking at in our mission areas. So this is, excuse me, big, big government issues, but is it big government? Because is it something that only the government is there to provide for individuals in a disaster or in a um, significant homeland security event? These are shared roles and responsibilities that our government's lying, uh, pa uh, paving a way for all of us to become integrated so that it's not just the government, it's you, your companies, your individual uh, responsibility, and an international component. So we're all working on this together. Lots of dots to connect. We've, uh, you heard mentioned that this is a complex environment. This is the website I like to use. It's kind of fun. It's called Silo Breaker. You type a word into Silo Breaker, and it will go out on the web and find everything related to the term that you plug in to on that website. But then it'll also allow you to plug in some of these other ones and just click on them and go to, to what else that's connected to. So helping you identify current documents, some of it research, some of it blogging, but you can separate that out so you know what has been actually researched. But so let's type in the word deterrence and you'll find immigration, you'll find political leadership, um, terrorism, Again, leadership, big issue for me. World Bank, national security, these are all connected. And if we don't pay attention to all the different nuances of this business, we will find ourselves without a preparedness strategy. A resilient society has this interesting functional performance curve where at 100%, immediately after an event without resilience, we are at zero. A resilient society has an impact falls to a minimal performance and back up very quickly. Bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is what I call real-time approach. Real being reality-based. We need to have programs designed that work with the way people will interact. We need a good execution strategy. We need to engage all stakeholders. We can identify the thing that we think will work best for this group, but if we don't have the right people here, we're not going to identify all those dots and recognize what we've left out. Adapt to the environment, adaptation to the complex environment and world we live in is critical, and leadership. Without leadership, we will fail. And then finally, the timeliness of it all. We need to know that what we need and what we do is attached to the timeline of events that we are projecting. If it isn't on time, it is too late. In an emergency, more time is not an option. It's not the time to start planning. Now, I didn't watch the time. How am I? I have uh, two examples of this reality planning that I'd like to point out. This is. Uh, based on data from the uh, pandemic influenza, the severe 1918-like, and the moderate pandemic in 1957. The U.S. population, about 300 million. This is data projected by the Centers for Disease Control. So if we look at illness and medical care, pretty much the same numbers, about 30% of the population uh, becomes ill, and 50% of those will show up at our medical facilities looking for some kind of care. But the number of patients that look for hospitalization and the number of patients that need intensive care are up significantly. And we don't have those kinds of resources. So as we start our plans, we ask ourselves, can we make that kind of capacity available, surge capacity, as it's referred to? Mechanical ventilations, and in some cases, we buy just the mechanical ventilations and say we're ready because we have a number of ventilators. But that doesn't quite work because you need the entire environment, what we call the stuff, the staff, and the structure to make the system work. 
and of course the number of deaths. The question comes up as to what happens when we don't have the number of hospitals that we say we're going to have to house our patients. Does that change these numbers? Well, it certainly does, but we don't quite know how it will change the numbers. And what we have to focus on is the number of patients that can survive and can be, have a better health outcome rather than focusing on this death rate. If we look at 1918 data versus 1917 data, what we see, the dark line being 1917, the lighter line 1918, we've always been taught and told that we have two spikes in the 1918 flu epidemic. This is the first spike, and October's the second spike. I would offer that those numbers are a little different, and as we look at the number of patients that we have to deal with, and we amateurize the casualty requirements over 12 months, the reality is in October of 1918, 4,000 patients a day were dying in Philadelphia. And we don't have the resources to deal with that. But what we do have is reality-based planning that says if that number are going to die, how do we deal with that? And if we try to save those that will probably die anyway, there will be a number of patients we could help that will also die. So we're working on a lot of processes to improve our reality-based training. So I will just leave you with my little moniker of real time, reality, engage, adapt, show leadership, and make sure it's timely as you plan. Thank you very much. Do you want to? All right, well, we're going to move from that overview and, 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 and to look a little bit more deeply into the resilience question, into the question of preparedness, because I'm sure people looking back, they look at, at the complex disaster in Japan this year, they look back at the economic crisis in 08, they read through the dire warnings of the IPCC reports in 07, they look back, you know, further and further we see a lot of, a lot of big activities. Have we learned? Are we more resilient? We're going to look at it sector by sector, beginning with the, the medical sector, and so I'll invite Christy Koenig up to talk a little bit about what we learned in after uh, the anthrax incident. Christy. Thank you very much, Richard. It's really a pleasure to be here. I don't know about you, but I feel safe. We've got the military, we've got IT support, we've got emergency physicians. I think we're in a very good place today. <laughs> so I'm going to share with you some of my experiences and perceptions. Um, as Richard mentioned, I have a, had a five-year stint with the federal government as the national director of the emergency management, which means disaster office and uh, at the Department of Veterans Affairs, and the time was 1999 to 2004. So you can see uh, 2001 certainly fell within that time. And I'm gonna focus a little bit on the anthrax attacks, sometimes called the Amerithrax attacks, which occurred in the fall of September 11th uh, after the initial terrorist attack. And one of the things that we did is we had to have these sort of top secret, you know, scrambled telephones, and we'd practice every week and make sure they worked, and I never thought I'd use it in real life. But one day, not long after 9-11, my counterpart at Health and Human Services, the director of the National Disaster Medical System, called me on the actual secure phone and said, Dr. Koenig, I just want to let you know we've discovered a patient in Florida, you probably remember this from the news, who has anthrax. And we were all on heightened alert thinking there might be a bioterrorism attack. Uh, but he said to me, we don't think this is actually bioterrorism. And in fact, the Secretary of Health and Human Services went into the news media and said, it's an isolated case. This person was out on a farm, he contracted it naturally, it's not terrorism. So initially, we didn't even realize that this was in fact a terrorist attack. 
And as you know, after 9-11, there were letters carrying anthrax spores that were mailed to several news media offices and two U.S. senators. Well, we weren't thinking that anthrax would be put through the mail, that an attack wouldn't be through the mail. This was a very new type of technology for us. This was an ongoing event, so it wasn't just a bomb and then you were in the recovery phase. It went on over several weeks. But despite this very large event with very huge impact to our country, in fact, there were only 22 direct casualties from this event. Five people who died from inhaling the anthrax, six people who inhaled it but survived, and 11 people who had the skin form. 22 people, not to belittle those people who were affected, but it's a fairly small number as you think about various different types of disasters. And in fact, very different than our modeling had been. When we were preparing in the federal government, for bioterrorism, we were looking at the scenario where a terrorist would take something like anthrax, a bioterrorism agent, weaponize it, turn it into a weaponized form, and release it through the air over a large urban population. The World Health Organization did some modeling, and what they said is if you take just 50 kilograms of anthrax or tularemia, which is another biological terrorism agent, and you aerosolize it, you make it into a form that you can release through the air onto an urban population of about 5 million, think about our local community here, a quarter million people will contract the disease. And of those from anthrax, we'll have 100,000 deaths, and from tularemia, 19,000 deaths, far more than the 22 people who were directly affected when this anthrax was disseminated through the mail. So this is the type of modeling we had been doing, but yet we experienced a slightly different type of bioterrorism attack. One of the health policy questions is then, how do we detect bioterrorism? How do we know it happened? It may be what we call a covert attack. The terrorists may release it through the air, not announce it, and days later, people will start having flu-like symptoms, going to local emergency departments, going to more distant emergency departments and clinics if they had left the area, flew, flown somewhere else, for example. How do we know it happened? Well, there are three basic ways. It could be through intelligence, so the intelligence community gathers information and knows what the terrorists are up to. It could be something called a syndromic surveillance system, where public health authorities are monitoring what's happening, and all of a sudden, they detect a blip over baseline. All of a sudden, more people are showing up at hospitals and clinics with flu-like symptoms, and we do an epidemiologic investigation and find out, oh yes, in fact, all these people were at the same sports stadium a few days ago, and that's where the agent was released. Or it could be what we call the astute clinician, a doctor or a nurse who's on the front lines who notices a case. Now, we don't always know immediately that bioterrorism has occurred. How many of you think that the anthrax attacks, as did some of our senators in Washington, D.C., were the first bioterrorist attacks on the United States in modern times? Nobody? A few, I, we, it certainly seemed so. But if you look back into 1984, in the state of Oregon, there was a cult, the Rajneeshi, who wanted to sway a political election, and they sprayed salmonella in the salad bars, and more than 750 people became ill. So they had an intent uh, for political gain, and this, by definition, is bioterrorism. What did we think? Public health authorities thought it's a natural outbreak. It was, in fact, years later before we knew and detected that this bioterrorism attack had occurred. So this is another bioterrorism attack on the United States, but most of you probably have never heard of it, and of course we've all heard of the anthrax letter attacks with only 22 direct casualties. How was that first patient detected during the Amerithrax attacks? Well, syndromic surveillance did not work. In my position with the federal government, I went up to New York after the terrorist attacks, and one of the things I did was I visited with some CDC personnel who were monitoring syndromic surveillance type of monitoring to try to detect bioterrorism. <clears throat> they were actually working out of a hotel room. You never would have known that it was CDC personnel. <clears throat> 
but they did not detect this. In fact, four patients in New York had already been seen and treated for cutaneous anthrax, the skin form, before this patient in Florida rang the bell. <coughs> and not to be too gory, but this is to illustrate an important point. This is a brain at autopsy with what we call hemorrhagic or the bleeding form of meningitis. This patient was discovered because in the cerebral spinal fluid, <coughs> he had an anthrax infection. So even though he had the inhaled form, which you can see is very rapidly progressive, only, only a few hours, the way that we detected it was because he had a spinal tap and they found this hemorrhagic meningitis, which about 50% of these patients have, in the cerebral spinal fluid. So it was that single case that let us know that we had a bioterrorism attack and initially we didn't even realize it was bioterrorism. <clears throat> now this are pictures of the cutaneous or skin form of anthrax but for those of us working on the front lines, if we don't suspect it, if we don't say, well, it was a postal worker in Washington, D.C. coming into the emergency department with this lesion, we might think it's a spider bite, or you've probably heard of this, the methicillin-resistant Staph aureus that occurs. They can look very similar. What about smallpox? This is another bioterrorism agent. Smallpox has been eradicated worldwide. We don't expect to see a single case of smallpox. So if we saw as an emergency physician, for example, one patient with smallpox, we would have to alert public health, but also law enforcement. This would be a crime, a terrorist attack. Anthrax, again, we didn't know initially it was terrorism, but it turned out to be so. How many casualties did we have from this anthrax? I mentioned those 22 people, but what I want to share with you is we have no good definition for casualty. Is it someone who's injured? Is it someone who dies? As an emergency physician, I'd rather have somebody injured or ill that I can treat than at a death. Is it someone who has a secondary issue? There's an earthquake and then you have a heart attack afterwards because of the stress of the earthquake. We don't have a good definition. What about the terrorist goal? Is the goal to kill a lot of people? They didn't kill very many people with that anthrax attack. Uh, we did change behavior. People were microwaving their mail, which doesn't work, by the way. I checked out the science on this. But across the entire country, even those of you here in California, I'm sure you changed your behavior. You had concerns, even though the anthrax attacks happened on the East Coast. I happened to do a site visit to uh, one of my staff in New Orleans not long afterwards and I was very concerned because of course on the way back to the airport I had to go to Café du Monde, you probably heard of Café du Monde, right? The beignets, those are really good. What do they have all over them? Powdered sugar. I was wondering how I was going to get through security with this white powder all over me. <laughs> but in fact I made it through because in security in the airport they weren't looking for bioterrorism agents at that time. They were only looking for your sort of standard weapons like guns. So I easily got through with my powdered sugar. How about all the resources this event put into place? Well, in our Department of Veterans Affairs, we had hundreds of people calling in with bomb threats, with seeing the powder on the donuts, and across the country, the FBI, for example, responded to more than 7,000 calls in a few months. And so what happened was somebody might be having a heart attack, call 911, that ambulance was busy looking at a powdered donut. So it has a huge effect on our society. We spent billions of dollars, for example, in the decontamination of the Senate Heart Building, in laboratory testing, in giving out prophylactic medications such as the antibiotic ciprofloxacin. Then there were a lot of social, political, or behavioral issues. For example, many of the postal workers in Washington, D.C. were African American. And what happened was we initially gave out ciprofloxacin, which is an expensive antibiotic, and we found that people didn't tolerate it. All the FBI agents had diarrhea as a side effect. They had diarrhea and they stopped taking their antibiotics. So we got smart and we said, doxycycline works just as well. We'll give doxy to the postal workers to protect them. Well, guess what? It was really cheap compared to the Cipro. And because this wasn't communicated well, 
there were real issues because they thought we're just giving them the cheap stuff and giving the good stuff to the congressional staffers and uh, to the FBI workers. So behavioral issues came into effect. We had people hoarding antibiotics. We had people going into the emergency department wanting prescriptions for ciprofloxacin halfway across the country where they weren't even exposed to anthrax. We had these compliance issues, the FBI agents that I mentioned. And the conclusion from all of this is that the science of disaster medicine is really in its infancy. It's just developing as a specialty. And there's many non-medical factors that are influencing our disaster management systems. So what we need to do, what my message is, we need to advocate for outcomes-based research and scientific inquiry to inform our policy makers. And these need to focus on patients and on protecting the public health. Thank you very much. We're going to look a little bit more deeply into emergency preparedness with Dr. Carl Schultz. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carl Schultz. I was just checking with my host here to see if I could walk around the room because I, when I talk, I usually do that. But because they're videoing this, I, told, I was told I have to stay here at the podium. So let me just de-mic myself here for a moment. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, um, just as some background, um, I have been you know, studying disasters <clears throat> excuse me, for about 30 years, my entire career, and uh, was asked to specifically look at the events after 9-11 and s try to sort of capture what we may or may not have learned from that event. And that's actually pretty easy to do because the chances for us to capture much data or much um, improvement in our processes from these events is actually quite small. Um, and let me, let me make a point, uh, let me illustrate this a little bit. How many of you have ever heard of the Johnstown Flood? Okay, we've got a few, good. All right, now this was an event that occurred over 150 years ago in a small town in Pennsylvania called Johnstown. There was a dam that was just upstream from the town, which was poorly maintained, but everybody knew this. There were many, many opportunities to intervene for a myriad of years, and yet for lots of different political and economic uh, reasons, they didn't intervene. And the dam one day burst, and the number of casualties that actually occurred was equal to the casualties from 9-11. The official death toll from the Johnstown flood is about 1,800 deaths. But many people who've studied this, and there's a nice book, I don't know if you, have you read the book about the Johnstown flood? It's a great text, excellent. And basically, the, the, the number of actual deaths is probably much higher, but so many, they didn't have good records then, so it's hard to capture that information. And so, um, when you look at that, uh, 150 years ago, this tragedy occurred, one would have thought that, hmm, this should really change what we do. But in fact, it hasn't. So that when we have an event like 9-11, um, it shouldn't surprise most people that, that the amount of impact it has on disaster preparedness may not be what we would like it to be. So, in, in the answer to this question is, where are we 10 years later? Are we better off than we were uh, at that time? I think I can say yes, we are. But the question is, are we as better off as we should be? The answer is no. All right, so um, the issues that we're going to talk about a lot here today have to do with security. And these are the classic sort of security events that everybody thinks about. Bombs, guns, that, uh, the slide up here, by the way, that smallpox. These are the kinds of, of things that people think of as fearful, terrorism, uh, I'm not secure, I need to be protected from this. And it's clear that citizens do need to be protected from these kinds of things. However, there are other kinds of events that occur. Uh, this is not smallpox. This is uh, basically your garden variety influenza virus, which rears its head every hundred years ago and kills millions of people worldwide. We have structural collapse. That was the uh, Minnesota bridge that collapsed there. Uh, this is New Orleans. We have floods and hurricanes. And of course, we have earthquakes. So these are all these events that will occur forever, even if terrorism eventually goes away, even if we finally get peace on Earth these events will continue to strike and kill people over the rest of, of human history. So unless citizens can be truly secure from these kinds of events, 
there will not really be a sense of security amongst the population. So while it is important to address those other events, failure to address disasters and to provide security to our citizens from these, the consequences of disaster, basically still renders us insecure. Now, specifically, I was asked to address what are some of the health care gaps that were outlined by 9-11 that may or may not have been completely resolved by now. And that is a little bit like trying to define the universe and then give three examples. So um, I, I had to try and sort of cull this down to a couple of things that I could do uh, within 10 minutes. And, and so I have. So it, it, the, the overview will be, by definition, brief because of the, the time limitation, but I think you'll get a sense of, of what we faced, how far we've come, and, and how far we have to go. So the first one is right up here. This thing the, called basically a surge capacity. Um, uh, uh, Donna Barbers talked a little bit about that earlier. I'm going to focus specifically on the provider side of this. In other words, the people. Um, and, and how do we get volunteers uh, rapidly to areas of large medical need. The second topic I'm going to talk about is the standard of care for disaster victims. I'm not sure if any of you are aware of this, but this is a raging debate right now in this country, including uh, some, a lot of discussion by the Institute of Medicine trying to uh, crystallize thoughts on, on what is the standard of care because it drives everything else we do for disaster victims. And I can tell you right now that there is not a lot of unanimity of thought on this idea. And we'll get into the, the standard of care in a minute. And then the last thing, of course, is this thing having to do with scarce resource allocation. Clearly, after disaster, there's more demand for health care than there is supply. How do we appropriately um, dispense this care in the most efficacious manner? So those are the three things that really were highlighted by the events of 9-11. Amongst others, I picked those three. And let me spend a little bit of time on each one of those. To start off with, I'm not sure how many of you have a medical background, but uh, for those that, who don't, basically there is this thing called credentialing of medical providers. So in a hospital in Orange County, where I work, I have to become credentialed by the hospital. They have to review my uh, training, they have to review my experience, and decide whether it's okay for me to practice emergency medicine at that hospital. Now, I happen to work at UCI Medical Center. There's a hospital a mile away, many of you have heard of it, called St. Joe's. I cannot practice at St. Joe's. I can only practice at UCI because I am not credentialed at St. Joe's. If I want to practice at St. Joe's, I have to go through the same process at St. Joe's that I just went through at UCI. This is a hospital by hospital uh, process that occurs across the United States. And this is all controlled by the Joint Commission. So that as, as perhaps irrationally as it seems, if I can get privileges at a hospital a mile away, why don't I have privileges at St. Joe's? That is how the system was created. And the idea is to protect patients, to make sure that anybody that works in a hospital knows what they're doing. Um, after the World Trade Center, there was a, a concern that there would be a large number of victims presenting to the hospitals in the area. And they wanted to pull people who are not on duty, other practitioners from other hospitals in New Jersey, into New York to support the hospitals. They couldn't do that because these individuals, as I just explained, are not credentialed to work at these hospitals. So there isn't really today an effective means of getting people from St. Joe's to UCI to back up those people who are sick at UCI if there was a disaster. We do not currently have a system that can make that work effectively. Now, the federal government tried to um, address this issue, and, and in fairness to the federal government, they, they made a reasonable pass at this. Uh, they created something called the Emergency System for the Advanced Registration of Volunteer Health Professionals. By that very length of title, you can pretty much be sure it was, in fact, a federal government intervention. <laughs> Anyway, um, we call it ESAR VHP for short. This is a state-based system, so each state gets to sort of do with it as they wish. Um, and the advantages of this is if you are credentialed through this system, so you, you now have essentially hospital privileges across your state, you can not only go anywhere in your state, you can go anywhere in somebody else's state and take care of patients. So it sounds pretty good. So like the com commercial for Miller Lite, it tastes great, less filling, seems really great. Only one problem. It doesn't work. This is a system that is very um, labor intensive for the physicians and the nurses. There's a huge uh, uh, paperwork process to get uh, credentialed by this system. And as a result, what's happened is very few people have signed up for it. In fact, 
The number of people who are signed up for this system are usually the people who are on the disaster medical assistance teams or the um, urban search and rescue teams, or you name the team that the federal government is supporting, they're all the same people. So if the disaster medical assistance teams are dispatched, there goes all of your volunteers from the ESAR VHP system because it's all the same. It's just too much. There's not enough physicians who are participating. What we could do, and it's available, is to create a hospital-based credentialing system. Each hospital has already credentialed all of us. Every physician, Dr. Koenig, myself, uh, Dr. Drake, who was here earlier, all of them could have privileges at multiple different hospitals if a hospital-based computerized system were created. It's easy to do. It's even been published. Uh, the uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality has incorporated uh, this process into one of their pediatric systems for dealing with disasters. But to date, we have not done so. So we have a better system. It could be put in place, but we haven't done it. The second issue I want to talk about is the standard of care. Now, because in disasters we now go from taking care of individuals to taking care of populations, we have to come up with a sort of a metric that measures physician performance and nurse performance and even laboratory technician performance so that we know and you know you're not getting substandard care, that you're getting the best care that can be delivered. So we need a definition for what the standard of care is. The Institute of Medicine, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, they have all been working on this. The problem with this system is, and as, as they, are, they mean well and they're, they're trying to do good work, is because it's predominantly run by practitioners like me, there has been a drift in this mission and the focus has become more and more on liability. And in fact, um, the, the input from providers has been substantially what this uh, entity has considered. Uh, has anybody in this room heard about uh, talks of dis dis discussing the standard of care in disasters or altering the standard of care? I didn't think so. Uh, the problem is the input from people like you who are actually going to have to consume this product, this is designed for you by the way, uh, has not been there. You have not had a chance to really vet this uh, and it's almost a done deal. The f because of the focus on liability, the, f the, the issues about the quality of care have sort of been sidetracked. And I think that what we, what we have to do is step back for a moment and reconsider what are we really trying to accomplish. What we really want is good care for patients. And we have to then ask ourselves, is the current standard of care really that bad? And by the way, just as a review, the current standard of care is, is right up there on the board. What a reasonable and prudent physician would do under the same or similar circumstances. That's the standard of care as we work today. And there is a, an assumption that that is somehow flawed for disaster victims. And the question is, is there any evidence for this? And the answer is, remarkably, no. Matter of fact, does anybody in this room know how many physicians in the United States in the last hundred years have been sued for malpractice for providing care in disaster? Anybody have a guess? Zero. None. Squat. Nada. Nobody's been sued for providing medical care in disaster in the United States in the last hundred years. So why is this system broken? That's the question we have to answer. To this date, this has not been resolved. The last point I'm going to make is dealing with allocation of scarce resources. In a disaster, as I said earlier, uh, the, the focus goes from the individual to the population. Um, currently, as we sit around this room today, if anybody here started having chest pain or uh, had a heart attack, they would go to the hospital, they would get as much care as they need. No questions asked. However, after a disaster, that doesn't work. There's simply too much demand. We don't have enough physicians, nurses, medical supplies, operating rooms, what have you, to meet the demand. Therefore, we have to come up with a rational way of allocating these resources to do the most good for the most people. Our focus has to go from something like this, where you have an individual cared for by a physician in the healthcare system, receiving as much care as they need, to something like this, where basically you have a lot of people demanding a lot of care, and you have to somehow figure out who in this group gets care and who doesn't. So, and this has to be done in a very ethical manner. It's not simply where the, the, the first come, first serve, or the strong get the first, uh, who can take away from the weak get it. It has to be done uh, in, in a fair and equitable manner. And it is possible to do this. There are outcome uh, algorithms that will, in fact, 
uh, dictate a rational way of allocating these resources. For instance, you can't just say nobody over 65 gets health care. What you can say is that age as it affects prognosis may be a factor. But the young, the old, all are entitled to the same health care. If we go back to that, what's the standard of care for disaster victims? And there are many uh, options to do this. There has been some published work on this where the, uh, anybody would get care based on the resources that were available if they had a 50% chance of survival. Obviously, that would apply to everyone. There's no age bias there. There's no religious bias. There's no social economic bias. And in fact, UCI Medical Center has adopted this particular uh, algorithm for allocating scarce resources should there be a large-scale disaster and UCI has to essentially ration care. This is the algorithm they would use. Um, but this has not been adopted worldwide. It's not been adopted certainly in the United States. And these are issues still that remain uh, to be decided. So essentially what I've tried to do is sort of summarize a couple of events that were highlighted by 9-11. And for those of you who have been studying this area, has probably been highlighted by multiple disasters going back to the Johnstown flood 175 years ago, um, but still, and, and probably are, are, are slowly making progress, but need more work. We still do not have an effective method to credential volunteers. We have a better system than we had uh, at 9-11. We have ESAR VHP, but it is too slow and, and just doesn't provide the number of highly qualified people we need. A better system needs to be created. It has been proposed, but it has not been adopted. Uh, at least now, we are having a debate about the standard of care in disasters. It has not been resolved. Uh, but before a conclusion is made, I think the people in this room need to be consulted on this, because ultimately, it is you who are going to be uh, the supporters, the consumers, those people that this whole thing is designed for. And your input it would be critical to make sure that the uh, uh, well-meaning individuals who are creating the standard or looking at the standard of care don't get sidetracked by their own self-interest, i.e. liability. And lastly, um, creating resource allocation protocols. Uh, there are some that exist. They have not been widely standardized or incorporated, but some are out there. Uh, more work needs to be done to bring those into the fold. Uh, we clearly have a long way to go, but I think we have made some progress. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Carl. Um, we're going to turn now from, from looking at, at some of the gaps, considering some of the gaps in the emergency medical field, to looking at, at the private sector. And I'll invite Alon Stevie up to, the, to give our next presentation. Thank you, Richard. Uh, it's a pleasure being here today, and I want to thank uh, Richard Matthew and Kuza uh, for all their effort and dedication over the years for making our world a better place and a safer place. Today I'd like to address the issue of uh, social infrastructure critical preparedness gap. All right, so since 9-11, we spoke a lot about 9-11 today, we made some significant progress in preparing for potential emergencies and terrorist attacks. It's a new world out there, and we're all very familiar with the changes that it has done to our lives, as well as uh, what it done to our society. The government has invested uh, considerable resources at uh, making a, a world a safer place since 9-11. There's been a strategic focus and coordinated intelligence effort, effective development and execution of initiatives by the government, uh, supporting policy with structures and regulation, and the uh, Department of Homeland Security was formed which includes Custom and Border Protection, Federal Emergency Management Agency, Immigration and Custom Enforcement, Transportation Security Administration, which we all had experiences with, and uh, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service, uh, U.S. Coast Guard, and U.S. Secret Service, all working together in making our country safer. Interagency cooperation has indeed improved. I'm part of the system myself, and I can attest to that. We've made uh, good impact and good progress on fighting the war on terrorism, and uh, our country is a safer place because of that. There has been uh, multiple terrorist attacks dwarfed and stopped for the last 10 years due to these efforts.
The focus of the government, however, has been uh, reinforcing uh, critical infrastructures. So the agricultural, food, chemical, communication dams, you see the list is long and important. And billions of dollars have been invested in hardening the critical infrastructure, which is indeed important to support survivability during any type of emergency and disaster. However, that's not enough. There is uh, significant preparedness gaps that still exist. Uh, there is a lot more to societal resiliency than the critical infrastructure. Uh, the LA riot September 11 terrorist attack in Katrina have shown us that the response infrastructure is quickly overwhelmed, recovery effort is very slow, and uh, populated metropolitan areas are particularly vulnerable. So the lack of preparedness of our social infrastructure is the unspoken vulnerability of our time. And this is something that must be addressed and addressed promptly. Our businesses, communities, individuals, families are not aware, nor are they prepared to care for themselves or support a large-scale disaster response and recovery effort by our government. Rapid return to normalcy of a social infrastructure is key to recovery. We all know that the longer it takes to return to normalcy after any type of disaster, the longer the impact and the more severe the impact of that particular disaster would be, both socially and economically. So these are the, the uh, gaps that uh, we see at Akam Logic as part of our uh, social infrastructure uh, 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 challenges. The, the first of all is the assistant gap. American society has become emergency dependent. We are a one-stop 911 society. Most of us expect that our government will take care of us in any emergency. We think that we're going to call 911. There'll be somebody there to uh, answer the phone and come to our aid. As some of our previous speakers here have made the point, uh, that is not uh, uh, realistic. Public expectation is that help will arrive in a minute, but even our government, Janet Apolitano says, a real security requires the engagement of our entire society with government, law enforcement, and the private sector and the public all playing their respective role. Uh, we've uh, had an announcement by our government in May, which was the preparedness month, that told us that we have to be self-sufficient and self-reliant for at least the first 96 hours following a disaster. Uh, many things that the 96 hour model is highly optimistic. We were at the uh, Orange County Red Cross Preparedness Conference last week at the NIM Convention Center, and one of the keynote speakers was Scott Brown, the battalion chief for the Orange County Fire Authority, and he thinks so as well. He actually uh, discuss the response of the authority, uh, both fire and law enforcement, during the Orange County power outage not too long ago, about a month ago, if you guys remember. It was about eight hours without power in certain area of the county. And he was discussing on how overwhelmed the system is, or was, and how overwhelmed their response were, uh, dealing with uh, issues, simple issues, like uh, no power for a gas station. So that means a bunch of people were stranded without gas. Uh, no power for uh, registers for food. So people were going out hungry, and hungry people are mad people. There were also uh, was no power at the intersection. So people were, instead of slowing down, ignoring the fact that there is no light working and speeding through the intersection, which caused multitude of accidents. Just that alone overwhelmed one of the finest emergency response mechanism and system in the world here in Orange County. That's just a power outage. So he was there, and I, I, I have to be honest with you, I was both surprised and pleased to hear his candidacy about the issue and discussing the fact that what he was mentioning is the 10-ton elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about, uh, and discussing the fact that there may not be, or there very likely won't be, enough emergency responder, both fire and law enforcement, ready and available to address all our issues during a, a regional large-scale emergency. Uh, so there is another gap that we've identified for the social infrastructure, and that's the resource assumption gap. And conductor here addressed that in his remark just a few minutes ago when he was talking about hospitals preparedness and response after a disaster. Look, we just had the great California shakeout and that was a great success. But everyone showed up on time and did their part as scheduled. The fact of the matter is we have to consider the possibility that half 
50%, half of the workforce, will not go to work following a disaster. A study of healthcare worker attendance in the event of an avian influenza pandemic found that only 50% said yes, they would return to work the following day, 80% said no, 8% said no, and 42% said it depends. The hospital can protect me and my family if my family is safe. Uh, this is human nature and no one will leave parents, children or pets in danger. And this was provided to Kuza by uh, uh, Dr. Schultz here uh, uh, just a few months ago. So survival, parental instinct and self-preservation drive individual response during an emergency, not government plans. Uh, throughout my life, I've been in civil wars, and I've been in some of the most dangerous places in the world. And I've seen people respond to two emergency. And I'm here to tell you that human instinct does take over, and it supersedes logic and supersedes planning. And if we haven't addressed this human aspect of emergency and preparedness, we have a significant gap. The White House uh, agrees. Uh, it seems that uh, they've identified the Presidential Policy Directive Number 8 on March 20th, uh, 30th of 2011 as identify all the things that we as a society need to do to prepare for disaster and emergencies, large scale. Uh, and I'll just read to that. Intended to galvanize action by federal government, capabilities-based approach to preparedness, integrated national planning, covering uh, prevention, protection, mitigation, response recovery, which is taking place on the governmental level, and to include guidance to support state, local, tribal, and territorial government planning. But most importantly is the last point, which is to include recommendation and guidance for businesses, communities, and families, and individuals as well. So my, our question is, mandating action to Secretary of Homeland Security is a good thing, but what, how, and where is it done? I think a national uh, goal should be sustainable resilience. And sustainable resilience is uh, something that cannot just be administered by the government. The government said that resilience means being prepared on five fronts. Prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. And all the investment to date on this have been done top down. However, emergency preparedness is a bottom-up challenge. It begins with families, schools, and local businesses. Families and social leadership organizations need effective preparedness support, not just a typical after the pack, uh, temporary or sporadic effort. Everybody is wiser after a disaster happens, and everybody starts looking for uh, the, the equipment and the supply and the training and the know-how of how to deal with an earthquake or fire after it occurred. And that, of course, is too late. So a family-driven, community-based, local response capability is a must. We believe at Acom Logic that Homeland Security starts at home. So the solution, really, to make our society truly resilient and sustain that resiliency is to invest in hardening the social infrastructure. The social infrastructure consists of groups and organizations that focus on family, culture, the elderly, business and productivity, workforce and employment, faith, education, social networking. We've seen the power of that with the Arab Spring, community welfare, and neighborhood safety. All those are factors that the government doesn't directly address currently. Social infrastructure drive civility and social order, public morale and resolve. Reducing dependency on the outside assistant is necessary to achieving a robust, resilient nation. Self-reliance, regardless of government involvement for future generation, is the true freedom for fear that people are seeking. So here at Outcome Logic, we've created a solution, and I'll talk about it briefly. Uh, I'm, I'm the type of guy that throughout my life, I've, I've seen a lot of challenges and problems, and I don't like to talk about them unless there is something we can do about it. It's all about doing something, not just talking. So we've created a solution for the last three and a half years, my team and I at Outcome Logic, that we believe address this issue of preparedness of the social infrastructure at the core or at the basic level of the family. We need to have an, a, a, a program or some sort of a way for family to have information on how to be better prepared in their own environment. And what's provided by the government is very generic. It addresses uh, preparedness for earthquake fire or whatever that may be in a, general, in, in a generic term. 
It doesn't apply to our specific circumstances, to our own family, if we have children, if we have elderly, if we have people that are disabled, if we live in a forest, if we live in a city. All those factors are different from family to family, and those are different challenges during an emergency. This program that we've created addresses all these issues, and there are many more to come. Cybersecurity, earthquake, terrorism, crime, fire, extreme heat, flood, and on and on. And it addresses it online, allowing each family to self-assess. Uh, it's called SAFE, Self-Assessment Family Emergency. And allow individual families to go online and self-assess their level of preparedness as well as the level of risk and exposure to any one of those challenges. It takes about between 20 and 30 minutes, 40 minutes of anyone's time. It can be done 24-7 uh, from anywhere in the world as long as you have access to the internet. And it deals with any one of those subjects in very much details. It's like having a group of subject matter experts like ourselves on this panel coming to individual homes and providing an assessment, an audit of that family's particular preparedness level and risk level, and then providing that family particular detailed recommendations on how to be better prepared for that particular concern that they have, whether it's fire, earthquake, terrorism, whatever. We have put this out two and a half weeks ago, after three and a half years of work, for free to the general public, as part of our effort to do something for making our society and the world a safer place. We are planning on translating that currently to Spanish and to many other languages and taking this information and useful practical solution to as many people who are interested in preparedness worldwide. So I'm here to uh, discuss this issue present a solution, a viable solution, that can make a big difference on a societal level with the social infrastructure preparedness. And I'm calling upon any one of you and anyone you know to take advantage of this opportunity and become better prepared and better informed by going online to outcomelogic.com or safeoutcome.com and simply uh, testing yourself. I mean, you should ask yourself right now, if I ask in this room, who among you feels or believe that you are completely prepared 100% for any one of those uh, challenges there on the screen. 100%. One. To any one of those challenges. Okay, we have one person. That's very impressive. <laughs> now let me ask you the next question. How many of you believe that your neighbors, any one of your neighbors is prepared 100% and the family and the children and the pets for any one of these challenges? Yeah. No hands. And how many of you believe that our entire community is prepared? No hands. Obviously no hands. It is because we had no possible viable solution to date. We know this, the, the, the threats are there, the risks are there, but there wasn't a possibility to correct them on an individual personal level. Now there is. I thank you for your time. So citizens are doing things. Um, they're using technology in creative ways to try to gain better understanding of, of disasters and to, and to respond more effectively. And I'm going to ask Gloria Mark to join us on stage and talk about information technology and uh, disaster response. And I just had to find that. Is that right? All right. So um, I, I hope my talk uh, might present uh, a more optimistic view of, uh, of disasters. So I, I look at how people use information and communication technologies to respond to and recover from uh, crises. Now, of all the um, interviews that we've done, this remains my favorite quote. And this was from an individual who had experienced the 2006 Israeli-Lebanon war. This person says how easy it is for the unimaginable to become the routine. And so you often hear people using adjectives like surreal when they describe what it's like to be in a crisis. So crises are not new. Terrorist attacks are not new. But what is new since 9-11 is that we now have social media, we have uh, mobile devices, people are using blogs, Twitter, 
Facebook, uh, instant messaging, uh, SMS, to um, in very unusual and creative ways to respond to disaster. Now, before all this social media came into play, we only had formal response. We had official channels. These uh, acted in a control command kind of structure. Uh, it was more of a push kind of mechanism where instructions would go out at certain intervals through certain broadcast channels. Now we have citizens. So citizens, in fact, can uh, use whatever media they have at their disposal. They have an internet connection. They can use uh, internet to basically uh, broadcast themselves. So these, the, in contrast to this kind of top-down mechanism, we now have citizens who are using a bottom-up approach, citizens in the trenches experiencing the disasters. So let me uh, just talk about this for a minute. So this characterizes the different sociotemporal phases of a disaster. So you have uh, the pre-disaster phase, which is what we think of as normal society. There's a stage where there's warnings that there's something that might happening, the threat where uh, the disaster becomes more imminent. You've got the actual impact. You've got a phase where people take stock of what's going on. You've got the uh, acute rescue phase. Then you've got a, a phase where um, people are, uh, victims are being resettled. And then you've got the recovery phase, which can actually last for years. Uh, in the case of 9-11, it's, it's even been a decade. And what we found is that uh, ICTs, information and communication technologies, are being used at every one of these different phases to help people manage uh, disasters. So when we think of disasters, it's, it's not just the physical uh, problems that people have to deal with, but there's also social psychological issues that people have to deal with, like trust. Who do you trust? Imagine that you're in a war environment. We've studied people in war environments. They can't trust their neighbors anymore. They can't trust people they meet on the street. They might be insurgents. Identity changes. So if you've experienced a crisis, crisis, your whole identity changes. You're now, you're no longer the person you were before. You're a victim or you're a survivor. And you've got a whole new set of um, uh, aspects that you have to deal with. And then culture, of course, changes. And I'm going to talk about culture. I'm going to give you a, an example in Iraq of how culture has changed. But the ways that we practice culture in what we consider a normal environment are no longer possible in the, when there's a disaster. So ICTs enable people to act independent of their physical environment. So these are photos on the left. These are Israelis who are in a bomb shelter. On the right, these are Iraqis who are watching a soccer game. They don't have the luxury of having bomb shelters. But they're not, in both cases, these people were not able to go out because it was just too dangerous to be in the environment. But with uh, ICTs, people can essentially act uh, independent of the fact that they're, that they're isolated, that they're confined to being indoors. They can actually interact with everybody, anyone who else who has a uh, connection to the internet. This is an example of uh, how ICT was used during the warning phase. Uh, this was um, in Israel during the Israeli-Lebanon War 2006. And uh, this started with a very small village where they experimented with using SMS to send siren warnings instead of having loud you know, audio sounds. And then they found that people took this one step farther so when people would travel, for example, they subscribed to these SMS messages so that they could find out what was happening in, in their uh, town. Uh, people would pass on these messages to their friends, their family. So it was a way to expand 
the the state of awareness about what was happening in their own um, in their own villages. Uh, you've probably heard of safe lists. So safe lists are basically uh, lists of uh, who has survived uh, a disaster. So it's enabling people uh, to find others. This is an example of a, a safe list that was used after Katrina. But um, the internet is a way to enable people to find others to basically extend the reach. This is uh, what I think is a, a, just a wonderful potential about how um, information technology can be used. And this uh, uses the idea of crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing has to do with collective intelligence. Collective intelligence using the internet. And this is what, uh, what this uh, Tweak the Tweet uh, invention was. So imagine Twitter. There are so many messages that are sent out through Twitter. It's really an information glut. And it's hard to make sense of all these messages. Imagine that you're in a disaster. How do you know which messages to respond to? How can you even find appropriate messages? But by using crowds sourcing by using the um, basically the collective intelligence of all the participants on the internet. What uh, these researchers did was uh, recruit people to translate uh, tweets. Uh, this, this first message on top, which says uh, Delman, was from a person in Haiti that was requesting help. And people from all over the world would see these tweets, and they would translate them into a syntax that could be readily understood by either machine intelligence or automated methods to, um, to make sense of them, or other individuals. So for example, um, you see these uh, hashtags. These are the pound signs. They essentially translated that first message into um, Haiti needs food the name of the person, location, institute, France. So this would be a way to um, enable people or automated methods to make sense of you know, large scale information and to be able to send help. So Twitter is also used um, for those people who um, opt to let their geolocation information um, be broadcast. Uh, people can um, broadcast for help using Twitter. And um, there are organizations that take this information and create maps to show exactly where these Twitter messages originated from. And this is also a way for um, people, for responders, to know exactly where help is needed and also to learn about the state of what's going on. So it creates a large scale situational awareness. And again, it's coming from the trenches. It's coming bottom up from, from citizens. So we've been looking at uh, how citizens in Iraq are adapting to uh, living in a very unsafe environment. And uh, one of the studies we did was to look at how they've been using Facebook. And Facebook is really used in interesting ways. On the one hand, it's used just like the way people in you know all over the rest of the world use Facebook, but it's also used in two very important other ways. Number one, it's used for um, getting direct help and for giving assistance to people who need aid. And secondly, it's helping people in Iraq rebuild their countries. For example, this is a page of people organizing to, um, which is called Iraqis for Women's Rights. There's also pages that are helping to organize educational resources. Uh, I won't go into these uh, in a lot of detail, but just to say that um, 
a lot, a, a significant number of people in Iraq who are using Facebook are using them in ways to help them uh, to recover uh, from from their unsafe environment. Uh, for example, 85% have used Facebook as safe lists to be able to find families and friends. Um, another interesting um, part down here says that 89% state that they use Facebook to maintain umti ra. Now umti ra uh, refers to in the Iraqi uh, culture, uh, it's, it's a way for people to uh, visit others uh, for various social customs. So when people get married, when there's you know various kinds of uh, religious festivals, ordinarily people would visit them and pay um, you know pay respects and um, bring presents. Well, this is now being done on Facebook because it's such a dangerous environment to travel in. I mean, people are getting kidnapped. There's insurgents. There's bomb threats, and so rather than take the risk of traveling, people are now transferring these practices uh, to Facebook. People use cell phones as ways to negotiate finding safe means of transportation. People in Iraq don't trust ta taxi drivers. Um, so what they're doing is f they do what they call cell hopping, which is basically creating lists of safe drivers, sharing these lists with people in their social network, and they're relying on these individuals to be able to give them safe transport. Now we can also look at the social media not just from individual perspectives, but we can look at it from a societal perspective. And so um, my research team and I have used a technique, it's called topic modeling, which enables us to uh, make inferences about large scale data. And this is looking at the Iraqi blogosphere. And what's interesting is that we've um, differentiated two kinds of topics that are blogged uh, from since January 2003, since uh, the Iraqi war began, through um, last year, July 2010. And we looked at blogging about war versus blogging about daily life. And you might consider that maybe blogging about daily life could be a representation of normalcy. What's really interesting is the mirror image nature of these two curves. And if you look at this uh, peak, let's see if I can use this, yeah, I can use this laser pointer. Right here is when there was a, a real, the real height of violence in Iraq um, from 2005 to 2007. And this is when um, the peak blogging about, about war occurred. And what's really interesting is this inverse uh, uh, nature with blogging about daily life. But you see what happens is that over time people tend to resume blogging about daily life. And you know, this could be a way to take the pulse of a nation, to try to get a sense of, you know, what is on people's minds when they're experiencing a crisis, in this case, when they're experiencing a war. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing, we did the same thing for the Egyptian blogosphere from 2004 to 2011. And um, let me just point you to look at this last part here, which is again looking at doing a large scale analysis of the topics that people blogged about. And what's interesting here is this crossover point. So we see that people blogged about um, uh, personal topics up until uh, shortly before um, the January 25th uprising, and then there was this precipitous drop. But what increased was blogging about the revolution. Now this crossover point actually took place before the, uh, the January 25th uprising. So it could almost be predictive of what was uh, to come. So the, the blogosphere or social media in general when looked at at a societal level can um, perhaps give a, a sense of what a society is thinking and uh, where it's heading. 
last thing I just want to say very briefly is that uh, we should be thinking about how ICT can be used to deliver medical care. There's so many, not only to remote places of the world, but when people are experiencing disasters, as my colleagues here were talking about, it can be very difficult to deliver health care. So this is an example of the Vertel Med project, which is a um, an interface designed for cell phones. Cell phones are becoming ubiquitous all over the world, and it would be a way for people to communicate symptoms from anywhere to anywhere where they could get basic medical advice. And that's it. Thanks. And so now I want to uh, bring our final speaker of the day. Um, I don't know why it's so dark down here. <laughs> it's like uh, it's so dark I can scarcely see. Is there any lights in this place? Um, if we had an emergency kit, we'd have a flashlight right now. <laughs> but Professor Bert Tessing of the Army War College will offer us the, la the, the final parting shot. Richard put me at a disadvantage, uh, actually, through Carl. Both Carl and I tried to walk around. It's very difficult for a Marine to stand behind a podium because there is something inbred in us about a moving target being more difficult to hit. <laughs> but I wanted to just go ahead and talk with you all. What you're going to hear from me is something of a wrap-up, if you will, of a lot of good things that you've been uh, hearing. But I want to approach it initially from the, the perspective of the Department of Homeland Security, a much maligned entity, I will, I will be uh, want to tell you, and, and Roxanne uh, Cohen-Silver, if you really want to talk to someone who knows what she's talking about, Roxanne's a member of the Homeland Security Advisory Council, or, or was with the last administration. So we have come a great deal forward, but as we came forward, it was not a, 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 an easy beginning for the department as they kicked off. Keep in mind that uh, as they came forward, they had to do it by bringing together 22 very disparate organizations, and by the way, at the same time, developing a mission, and by the way, at the same time, implementing the mission in the face of an immediate, persistent, and multifaceted threat. Ready, set, go. Okay, and then from there, what they had to do Basically, at the beginning, at the beginning was, was easy. They just had to bring all these folks together. <laughs> now, that looks like a joke, and in fact, it was one. It was put up by the Wall Street Journal. But uh, Secretary Tom Ridge, who, by the way, prefers to be called Governor Tom Ridge now because governor's a lot more fun than being the secretary was, Secretary Ridge used this a lot because if you had gone to Washington, D.C. in October of 2001, and you said, all right, who's in charge of Homeland Security at some high polluting cocktail party, all of these people would have raised their hands. And that's all that Secretary Rich was called to bring together. Unfortunately, this next slide is not a joke. What this represents is the congressional oversight of the Department of Homeland Security. Now, when you talk to someone to, from the Department of Defense and say, who has oversight, basically you're talking about the House Armed Services Committee, Senate Armed Services Committee, and the defense subcommittees of the Senate and, and House Appropriations Committee. When you talk to someone in DHS about who has oversight, these are the people that they have to respond to. 82 committees and subcommittees of the United States Congress. The very United States Congress, by the way, who passed a law in 19, pardon me, in 19, pardon, 2004, the Implementation of the Post-9-11 Recommendations Act. A very poorly named entity, by the way. But the first recommendation of that great committee was consolidate congressional oversight. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just like leadership. If everybody's in charge, no one's in charge. If everyone has oversight, no one has oversight, and I will tell you, we need oversight. Nevertheless, the department was able to go forward, and in the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, if you were to look at it, there are five major core missions, if you will, that the department continues to work very, very strongly. The first and foremost and most of our minds is preventing terrorist attacks and enhancing our security. Beyond that is the question of securing and managing our borders, Beyond that, next we want to talk about enforcing and administering our immigration laws. Next we want to talk about safeguarding and security cyberspace, securing cyberspace. And then finally, of course, the idea, as has been brought up by several members of our panel, ensuring resilience in the face of disaster, whether that disaster is natural or very man-made in its source. 
Now, in every one of these areas, I could point to successes from the Department of Homeland Security. When you're talking about preventing terrorism, you can talk about things that have been done in aviation security, been done in surface transportation security, been done in critical infrastructure protection, been done in CBRM uh, concerns that, that Donna brought up very well. You could go on to securing and managing our borders, and you could talk about the border security and maritime security. And border security, border patrol alone, we now have 20,000 agents, uh, border patrol agents, along our borders. That's an increase of 110% since 9-11. And I will tell you that more is needed. But we're moving forward. As far as maritime security is concerned, who doesn't love the United States Coast Guard? I was in, a, I was in an event week before last where General Barry McCaffrey was out there and he says, you know, if you don't love the Coast Guard and the Boy Scouts, then there's something just wrong with you. But they are essential and what they've done has been great forward movements. When we talk about uh, securing and safeguarding cyberspace, things that are just becoming aware to the American public, things like the uh, National Cyber Incident Response Plan, things like the United States Customs, pardon me, uh, Computer Emergency <laughs> Response Teams, all these things have been initiated by the Department of Homeland Security and spread out towards our people. And then finally, when we talk about ensuring resilience, those of you, and, I, and I'm delighted to see some genuine first responders in the audience, those of you who have grown up in this regime of emergency management knows about the progress that we've made with the national response frameworks, the national incident management system, the incident command system, things of that nature, all moving forward. But we've got to go forward and, and further, and, and in fact we have, in spite of some of the help that Congress has given over time, or lack thereof. But before we go forward with any of the other discussion, I want to recommend to you thinking about what we mean when we talk about Homeland Security, the very definition. In the first national strategy for Homeland Security, this was the definition. And it made sense at the time. It was in response to the compelling notion of why the department was brought together. It was terrorism. So when we said Homeland Security, we're talking about a concerted national effort to prevent terrorist attacks, to reduce our vulnerability to those attacks, and to recover from and mitigate those attacks if they should occur. Made great sense, except to the emergency responders who are saying, wait, there's a lot more about securing the country than having to look after terrorists. And so over time, we became better at it. And out of the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, they came up with this definition, which I think is far more to the point and far more to the point of a lot of discussion you've heard from, from the other presenters today. The idea of Homeland Security being an intersection between evolving threats and hazards and traditional government and civic responsibility. Please pay attention there, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm not just saying government. Traditional government and civic responsibility in civil defense and law enforcement and customs in border control and finally, of course, in immigration services. Now, what does that really mean to us? It means that Homeland Security is not a governmental function. It is an enterprise. And the enterprise begins, of course, with the direction that you're going to get from the federal government. But oh, by the way, there are state and local governments involved in this. The problem with being in the, in the active duty military, you're going to have trouble with this, I'm going to tell you about it, is you grow up thinking, you know, if the federal government could get their act together, we would have this baby beat. And then you arrive at the unpleasant awakening that there are 57,000 jurisdictions in these United States, headed by 54 sovereigns, 55 if you count the one that lives on Pennsylvania Avenue. And they all want to do it their way by God. And it's our constitutional right. So, you got to pay attention to that. you got to pay attention to the private sector. What we, what we heard from um, uh, Alvin, Alvin, what Alvin had to say was absolutely essential. When we talk about critical infrastructure in the United States, 85% is owned by the private sector. If they are not intimately involved in securing that critical infrastructure, we got a problem. Going beyond the private sector, we've got non-governmental organizations. When we look at our, our, our core documents, the National Response Framework, once again, and they break down areas of essential, uh, essential support functions. You want to know who's in charge of mass casualties? It's not any one of the United States government. It's the American Red Cross, by design. <coughs> and it only makes sense. And there's a lot more examples of that. International partners. If you think our security begins at our borders, then you better start thinking about it again. And over time, as we have learned from our Israeli friends and from any number of other people throughout the world, our security and their security are inextricably entwined. And we have to play in that way well together. 
communities and faith-based organizations. I was so happy to hear this talk. Up until about 1950, ladies and gentlemen, the vast majority of emergency response, response and recovery in the United States, was covered by communities. The federal government very, very seldom got involved in it. Was that correct? No. Was it a stronger statement of community? Yeah, probably. I think we've gotten too far away from this. And then the following up, once again, on what Alian had to say, families and individuals. If you haven't got the kids that we're talking about, then you're part of the problem. But then you've got to go beyond that. It ain't just simplify, pull up the rope, I got mine. What about the sick people in your neighborhood? What about the elderly? What are you doing about them? What are you doing to make your community a community? Now, so we've talked a lot about the community aspect of this. We've talked about individual responsibility. But when you get back to DHS, I want to, once again, show you some of the difficulties they're having to deal with. First of all, they have to deal with this thing. It's basically what we refer to as a seam of ambiguity. Which, which points out the fact that security and defense, law enforcement, and, and all those other things that come together just kind of blur across the lines. And who's going to be in charge? So whereas one point, it's going to be clearly DHS. And remember, DHS is by far and away a law enforcement agency more than anything else. As it goes across that spectrum, and it becomes a question of, is this security or is this defense? Is this a danger or is it an attack? And when that happens, as soon as you hear the D word played, folks, defense, then the five-sided wind tunnel takes charge, and we know about it. But well between those areas, there's an awful lot of work that's got to be done within the federal government by way of coordination and cooperation. And then going back to what we were talking about a second ago, the question of balance between state and federal government. And, and it is not just, it's not just a rice, set of rice ball issues, ladies and gentlemen, because your governors your mayors, your county officials, know that at the end of the day, after response is over, recovery belongs to them. And if your only source of security in your mind is some green-clad monster running into town and getting the situation back under control and then riding off into the sunset, then you've got a problem. Your governors, your mayors, all those other county officials have got to retain the trust and confidence of the people in their jurisdiction in order to be able to go forward, in order to be able to sustain beyond the immediate response. And then there's the ultimate balance here that I want to recommend to your thinking when we talk about this, the balance between liberty and security. Now, one of the most, most often misquoted quotes that has gone on about this was one that people attribute to Benjamin Franklin. The correct quote is this, a people that would sacrifice their essential liberties for a little temporary safety are deserving of neither the liberty nor the safety. But I will tell you this, that security is not the end in our mind. Security facilitates the end. At the Army War College, when we talk about strategy, we talk about it in terms of being a measure between ends, ways, and means. Security is a way to achieve and to sustain. The end of concern for you and I is the American way of life. We can make our country much more secure and we can make it a place that we don't want to live in anymore. The American life, the American way of life, as those gentlemen said a long time ago, for ourselves and our posterity. Now I open up for questions for all my colleagues. Please. All right. Well, we have some. We have time for a few questions before we go out and have coffee, and you get to know the panelists a little bit better. So, if anybody has a question to any of or all of our panelists, I invite them now. Does anybody have a perspective on that, Gloria? Well, Christy. You raise a, a very important point, and one of the things we see over and over again in disasters is that communications are an issue. And so we do plan for all types of redundant communications. Uh, for example, one technique we use is satellite phones 
which will still work if the cell towers go down. But we also need to plan for automatic systems. If we have a truly catastrophic earthquake, it's possible we'll have no communications. And so we would need an automatic plan, for example, no to go to this place for help, or no to go to this place if you are a healthcare provider. And you have to assume perhaps the transportation infrastructure is disrupted as well as the communications infrastructure. So you might actually have to walk from wherever you are. And this is something uh, Dr. Schultz and I published a concept called medical disaster response, looking at exactly these types of issues. And there's a second issue that sort of confounds this whole um, process in that even if you mandated that cell towers had an infinite supply of power, which of course can't happen, but just follow me for a moment, many of the problems with communications is f because of the spontaneous use of the entire population of that one modality. So that even if everything remains structurally intact because three million people after an earthquake suddenly pick up their phones simultaneously and make a phone call, it basically locks out the system. So nobody can make a phone call. So there are, um, as Dr. Koenig said, there, there are fundamental uh, precepts about disaster, including the communications are incredibly vulnerable. So anyone who's planning to deal with disasters on a real-term basis with real-time uh, accountability knows that to rely on any kind of formal communication uh, pathway is probably uh, not a good idea. Yeah, on, on that end, <clears throat> on that end, uh, I want to add it's absolutely correct. And the first thing that always fell in an emergency or crisis in general is communication and communication channel between people. It's not about only having the device working, but it's about people knowing how to communicate effectively the essential element of information in the right and timely manner. Uh, my, my question to you is, who do you think you'd be calling in an emergency or a large-scale disaster that you would need the cell towers to work? Because if you think you're going to be calling 911, okay, everybody's been trying to do the same thing. We've seen that on 9-11, how the communication went down. Not because the tower went down, and I'm talking about communication tower, but because it got simply overwhelmed, as Dr. Schultz just mentioned. So the solution truly is local self-reliance, and uh, within the radius of communication, you could use handheld radio to communicate with your neighbors and, and, and assistants and coordinate a response, because that's the only thing that's really going to work for you. Thanks. Are there other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, Dr. Schultz, I was very surprised to hear that one of the big issues was the credentialing. And sitting here listening to you, I think we can all think of several systems that we could map out in five to ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you need some substance behind, but there are some very simple solutions to get through this. And I was wondering what the real issue is. I mean, if there's a will, you get through that. Is it that the various institutions do not want to share the credentialed information with other institutions because of supply of medical personnel or I mean, what's really the issue here? Uh, does it, did everybody hear the question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, uh, the answer is is that, that I will give you uh, I will deny after I leave this room. But um, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> <laughs> it 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 has to do with with, with complex entities <clears throat> when this. ESAR VHP first came out, um, I could see where the, where the problems were going to be. And so I called a member of Congress who was involved in this and tried to explain it to them and basically said to me, well, the train's already left the station. It's a done deal and this is how it's going to be. And I said, well, you know, we can always, re no, we've already spent $10 million on this and um, that's it. So the, the, the part of the process is that, that it's um, the wrong people um, were in charge of not so much the people that actually created it because they were given the mandate. So there's a lot of people downstream who basically didn't have any input. They were just basically given this task, build this system. But those that actually designed the system did not completely understand how disaster care is administered. And that the reality of, of requiring overburdened healthcare providers to spend a, an arduous task of, of filling this forms out and allowing tremendous flexibility in the quality, the the other issue I didn't get a chance to get into, but ESAR VHP is state-based. So in California, we could say, 
we ex essentially want what they call type one physicians, I'm gonna pick physicians because that's what I know, um, who are pe people like Dr. Koenig and I. Basically, we're an active practice, we get reviewed every two years, we are board certified, blah, 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 blah. Um, but <clears throat> it could be what they call a type four physician, which is actually my father. Now, my father is 86 years old, he's a psychiatrist, and he was a great psychiatrist, but he's not very good at managing the traumatic injuries that occur in an earthquake. But depending on how the state crafted their ESAR VHP regulations, my father might qualify to be a responder. And he's the first one that'll tell you that he's not qualified to be a responder. But he could by this system. And that gets back to the standard of care and all these other issues. That basically this is a it was an attempt by well-meaning people to try to fix a problem, which is good. It's just that it was approached in a way that, that is, is not going to be effective by people that don't completely understand what's going on uh, um, in the aftermath of these events. And uh, there were also some issues regarding um, the, uh, the, the kinds of personalities involved. And so it, it got very complicated. Um, there are, there have been new solutions to this. Uh, I uh, published an article in, in uh, the medical literature that talks about this. And this is what the um, uh, uh, AHRQ picked up, the um, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, in one of their publications, looking at taking this data, which every hospital keeps. We have to be credentialed every two years. So every hospital in the United States has a, a battery of information on all their credentialed people. And and this could easily be computerized and then shared amongst hospitals and it would be incredibly cheap and, and no additional work by any uh, practitioner, nurse, radiology tech, physician, and they would instantly be credentialable in any hospital in their area. And uh, it's just, it's frustrating that you can't get the the attention of individuals to do this, um, but it's 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 like everything. The reality is, it's not. There's no evil person behind it. It's not that somebody was stupid or anything like that. It's just that there's a lot of, of incentives to go in different directions, and uh, it's why disaster medicine has to become a science. And I'd like to make you aware of a parallel issue. Uh, this is an issue for people practicing at neighboring hospitals in a single community. But you heard earlier about the way our country is set up. Uh, it works local, state, federal. So when the local resources are exceeded, the state comes in to help. When the state resources are exceeded, the federal government steps in by invitation. In our country, we have state medical licenses. And so one of the large issues was when people wanted to go help out after Hurricane Katrina, me, for example, a physician licensed in California, I could not go practice medicine in another state. And so you would say, well, that's easy. Why don't we just have a national or a federal medical license? And that issue is because the states want to have control, their economic concerns, and so forth. So that's a big issue for us. Uh, there is one system where physicians can become federalized and work through these national disaster medical assistance teams. But for other physicians who want to help out, volunteer their time, they literally cannot do that because they don't have a license in the other states. We have time for one last question over here. I'll start with that. Um, there are numerous programs to talk about proliferation of all sorts of uh, weapons of mass destruction, and nuclear is one of them. Uh, what you, we have to do is take a look at this across the full spectrum of prevention, uh, elimination. It, it, it's a pretty complex process of trying to identify, and you saw one of the articles that I um, highlighted that today was uh, there was a statement that said uh, we're expecting another nuclear proliferation. and. Are treaties are the first place to stop so that sort of activity? Um, government processes of treaties and uh, sanctions are pretty significant, but you know they're not 100 uh, percent. When we look at nuclear response, um, we have a lot of harsh realities to look at. Uh, if you look at the Fukushima issues in Japan, you know that just a radiation accident accident, uh, nuclear accident, can have a pretty significant impact. So it's a complicated process, um, very political process when we're talking about other nation states. Um, not so much an issue on the terrorist side, more a nation state issue. So the 
very complicated process going on as we continue to uh, negotiate state to state. On that end, in my uh, humble assessment, the likelihood of a nuclear attack by a terrorist group is low. If you look at 9-11, they used box cutters and got really good quote-unquote return for their investment uh, without risking uh, being apprehended for transporting nuclear radioactive material, which is very easy to detect, and there's a lot of agencies looking at those things. I think it'd be uh, wiser overall for the population to prepare for low-tech terrorist type attack, active shooter, Mumbai-style attack, uh, swarming tactics, things like that, as well as disaster, uh, natural disaster, that will impact our community and occur a lot more often than any type of a nuclear attack. The likelihood of another country launching an attack against us nowadays is almost non-existent if you don't count North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> well, please join me in thanking the panelists and please join the panelists outside for the coffee.